So today is a complicated whiskey vault day. Welcome to the whiskey vault. My name's Rick. I'm Daniel. This we've, is a whiskey. We've moved on to Irish pot still in the history of whiskey. Okay. Okay. We're still doing historical things. Yes. Yes. We're still doing historical things. Now technically we probably should have done this one first, but it really doesn't matter. It's all around the same late 1700s, early 1800s. Sure. Um, that's when pot still Irish whiskey showed up for real, right? now. Two people gave us Red Spot 15. It's a new release. What does it have? From the Mitchell and Sons. Like the the bunghole on the top of the barrel. Because that's how you tap a barrel to serve it in a mercantile. Okay. So I don't you can't see, but there's a barrel instead of the bunghole being on, on the side. side where the crude of staves are, there's the bunghole on top where the flat circle is. My guess would be that's a uh, 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 callback to the mer mercantiles who used to have buy barrels and sell them, you would bring your own container back in the day. Okay. If you bought whiskey back in the day, yeah. you'd bring your own container, uh -huh. they would fill it with whiskey, Right. you'd cap it and take it home. And they tapped it from the top. No, no, they were just sitting like a normal tap, you know? Oh, so it's on the side, and yeah. you get the tap, and then... Yeah. Okay. And the longer it sat in the barrel, the better it tasted. Are you making things up? No, I'm not making things All up. Right. Okay, now two people gave us the red spot around the same time. Yeah. The first was Cat and Shane. Cat Rajne and Shane Jeffco. I'm telling you, man. This week, this month, it feels You're like a, it time. feels like a year. It's throwing off every fiber of my being. You poor thing. You know what? You do it. Karajne and Shane Jeffcoat, you magnificent bastards. <laughs> I couldn't resist telling people about you. Yeah, that's true. Everything we The did. second group was Greg and Ann Postage and their daughter Riley. Greg and Ann Postage and daughter Riley. The Riley? The Riley. The Riley. Riley, yeah. you magnificent Riley. Yeah. Hi. So Mitchell and the Mitchell family were merchants. Yeah. And they started selling. They started actually taking Jameson okay. way back in the day yes. and finishing it in sherry casks uh -huh. before selling it to their own consumers. Yeah. Right? Yes. Did you hear this? Yes. The cons imagine buying Jameson. They were one of the only merchants in Ireland who Jameson allowed to do things to the Jameson whiskey. Uh -huh. So they created this, this entire culture of merchant bottlings, special releases of different ages Yellow spot, green spot, red spot, and they even had a blue spot. Uh -huh. And th uh, this is a revival of that era. Mitchell and Sons is still going. One of the things that Mitchell and Sons did was take Jameson whiskey, pot still or grain, right. and put it in sherry casks. Well, that's what red spot is uh, part bourbon and also sherry butts and also Marsala wine cask. Okay. That's what you're smelling this. It's a 15 year old whiskey. Okay. It's Middleton whiskey. This is, this is a, a, a sweet, uh, delicate nose, but not wimpy. It's very present, it's very there, but you get the sense that there's a lot of uh, nuance, and I mean that not in terms of just generic complexity, but nuance in terms of there's a lot of subtle things playing with each other. Here. What's weird is I get and, a dominant note of red vine. And y'all, you're just coming at this with a cudgel. So I really much, am. So much more interesting than no, red No, no, it's, it's red way more vine. than that. But look for red vine and then surround that with green apple and uh, shortbread cookie and just the classic Irish pot still. So, 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 on the nose at least, I haven't tasted it. On the nose, I don't want to say shortbread cookie like that buttery cookie sweet note and think that's like a heavy hitting flavor in here. It's there, but it's much, much more subtle than what you're gonna get from a lot of well-known Irish whiskeys. It's not nearly as buttery, at least on the nose. Yeah, it's way more wine heavy than buttery heavy. Yes, it's so, so and, and this wine is, I think, a more apt comparison than a lot of the, a lot of the other whiskeys because it's that level of sweet, Delicate, nuanced complexity coming off of But those. it is bready, so you know what's weird is what's popping into my head is the check stop. Oh, the kolache place. Yeah, so a real fruit kolache. So people that don't know. It's uh, kolaches, it's, and uh, what's the name for the sausage kolache? You know, it's, it's not like, actually kolache. Think it's, uh, oversized pig in a blanket, 
But no, no, have... no. That's the sausage thing. Hold on. A real kolache is let a me, fruit pastry. Let me finish. If you're getting fruit pastry from the check stop, yeah. you're doing it wrong. No, that's the original kolache is fruit pastry. You're a heathen dog. A sausage in the pastry is not a kolache. A teacup poodle of heathenness. <laughs> <laughs> teacup poodle. That's a nice touch. <laughs> A real kolache, not this heathen kolache, pig in a blanket. It's not a real but you have kolache. a lot of different, different, a lot of different kinds of. You get cheese. Oh. You got ham. Oh. You got sausage in there. You can get different kinds. I'm snob struggling because. And then Daniel just likes you know jelly filled donuts. That's no, what no, I actually hate jelly filled donuts. Jelly filled donuts. So here's the thing: is the kolache war has begun. Ask any Czech kolache war. Ask any Czech human being, and they will tell you that a sausage in bread is not a kolache. You just called all Czechoslovakian people. No, I'm saying all the Czechoslovakian people are gonna side with me. Just wait for the comments. I'm telling you that the true kolache is a fruit-based bread. Do we need to make a trip to the Czech Period. Stop? Do we need to make a trip to the Czech stop? Yeah. How far is the Czech stop? It's like two hours from here. <laughs> yeah. Can they just like mail us? No, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You want me to get my phone and prove it to you? Oh, let's ask Siri. Here's, here's, no, this is what we're doing. We're gonna ask Siri. We're gonna ask Siri. What is a kolache? What is a kolache? Yeah, do it. Okay. Hey Siri, what is a kolache? A kolache is a type of pastry that holds a portion of fruit or cheese. Ha! That's it! End of discussion! <laughs> a kolache is fruit or cheese. Hold on, you, you, you interrupted the part. <laughs> Where it said sausage is everything. Yes. Now it's it's no, look, now no. it's just it's just constantly saying words no matter what we say. No, no, no. You got Do you wanna know what a sausage in a pastry is and called? The, and you know what she said immediately after that? I was reading it before she had a chance to say it, and everything I just said up to this point was, <laughs> was wrong. Right. Yes, that's totally not true. <laughs> so do you know what it's called when you have a sausage in a pastry? So this was actually invented in the US. And it was a Czech guy who realized that if you put the meat in the pastry, people really loved it. And he sold it at his shop that sold kolaches. And so the Americans thought, well, that's a kolache. It's not actually true. It's called a kabloznik. A kabloznik is a meat pastry. It's got the sausage in it. Hey, Siri. Yeah. <laughs> what is a kabloznik? Something on the web for what is a couple osmic? What is a couple osmic? <laughs> yeah, a couple osmic. K L O B A S N E K. As, uh, that's the sausage version. A kolache is fruit or cheese. Has anyone else made this observation? <laughs> I don't like this episode. This is a kolache. This is a stupid episode. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the easiest arguments I've ever won with actual facts. Six. Are, <laughs> the, this guy's name is on the subreddit. Yeah. Six arrests, no conviction. <laughs> Keeping it classy. <laughs> Has anyone else made this observation? I've been a mixed drink drinker forever, probably leading to some of those arrests. Yeah. Uh, rum mostly, but grew bored with it recently and happened across uh, the tribe's love of whiskey. As a newbie, I'm slowly developing the ability to pick out the nuances of smell. However, I recently picked up my empty glass and found it very easy to pick out different aromas. Without the alcohol in the way, I found it easier to smell the undertones. Yeah. Daniel Rex, anyone else experienced this? Yes. Yeah, uh, and, absolutely. And we recently did an episode talking about 10 whiskey hacks on the other channel. We'll link it up here. And that's what, that's, there's a very similar thing we're talking about there, about ways you can figure out how to approach the smell and taste of whiskey uh, and get more out of it as opposed to just, you know. So here's why that's happening. Fighting uh, through things. The reason that's happening is because a significant portion of the smell of whiskey is coming from the oils, right? And when you leave a glass out overnight and it evaporates and dries, what's left behind are the residual oils of the whiskey. And that's where a lot of the smell is coming from. And so in an empty glass, when you're not fighting with alcohol, you can actually get a lot more of the components that make up the whiskey. So on the taste, big perfumey floral note with yeah. that buttery, it's not the front leading flavor, but that buttery shortbread cookie, that classic Irish shortbread cookie note. If I had it's to, not dominant, it's there, but it's underneath this sweet honey flavor. If I had perfumey. to pick a Mitchell. Oh, and finish with a little bit of vanilla. Yeah, if I had to pick a Mitchell, Green Spot's still my favorite. 
This is second, and it beats 12 for sure. Okay. Significantly better than 12. All right. Um, now, okay, so why Irish pot still in history? Irish pot still, in 1785, the English passed a tax on malt barley. And that is when the Irish were like, well, let's use unmalted barley. <laughs> and that was the origins of the traditional style of Irish pot still whiskey, which always has a percentage of unmalted barley. So how, what's the difference between malted barley and unmalted barley? Uh, it has to do with uh, whether, well, malting is a process that essentially gets tricks the barley into growing a new plant, right. but then stops it before it eats all of the sugars. Sure. And that's malting. Yeah. If you don't do that, then it's just the seed, the same way that corn or rye is just a seed. Now, in a typical mash bill where you get corn, rye, and then malted barley, yeah. the malt is there to introduce the enzymes that start converting things into alcohol and encourage the yeast to go. Okay. Right? So, um, unmalted barley definitely has a flavor profile when you mix it with the malted barley. It's, it's definitely a thing. Now, this is a tr the beginning of a tragic history in Ireland. At the time that this first started being released, mm. there were around a thousand distilleries in Ireland. Ah, uh, oh, oh! Legal or not, a lot of illicit ones, right. but also some legal ones. Between this and the 1960s, right. uh, you have Ireland just gets hammered with one shitty thing after another. So, and by the time we hit the 60s, there's only one company that owns all Irish whiskey, and it's only being distilled at two places. And that's all Irish whiskey brands. So, I think there's a lot of whiskey drinkers out there who enjoy the Scotch, enjoy the Irish, and you know some American whiskeys, mm -hmm. maybe Japanese. They start uh, exploring a bit, and then they find out that there's very distinct regions of whiskiness in yeah. Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's like, well, I Irish whiskey's been around a super long time. Why aren't there that many distinct regions? And I, that's really it's because of the historical collapse of Irish whiskey. And it came down to become yeah. you know, most Irish whiskey is going to have a lot more similarities than what you're going to get out of Scottish whiskey. There's well, not a quintessential Scotch. Here's how I would change that. There's a lot of different Scotches out there, but when it comes to Irish, there's still variations. But the spectrum of flavors is going to be more narrow than what the spectrum is in Scotch. I think I would, I would agree with that, but I would also argue that the spectrum of Scotch may be terroir, location-based, mm -hmm. and styles, right? So you've got Highland has a typical style, and Lowland has a traditional style, and Isla has a peated style, right. and so on. In Ireland, you so, may not have geographical tell styles. Them, tell them what terroir means. Terroir is, is flavor based on the area land that you're on, mm -hmm. and you're growing grain from, and distilling in. And you're saying this even though Ireland and Scotland are very close. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is Ireland doesn't have a terroir difference because of their historical background, but they do have a style difference. So in Ireland, you can't say regions, but you can say styles. Okay. So I think there's three dominant styles of Irish whiskey, mm. pot still, yeah. malt, and grain. Okay. And in those three, you find three different styles of Irish whiskey, and often they're blended together to create interesting Irish whiskeys. Ireland has really gotten the short end of the stick, both for being somewhat closed off from outsiders has really hurt them. And then also um, getting hit by famine right around the time of a war and then prohibition and then another war. And then, uh, yeah, just over and over. They, and then, honestly, the reason they didn't succeed during prohibition, remember Scotland sent a whole bunch of illegal whiskey to the US yeah. and Ireland didn't because they had morals. What are you thinking? Yeah. So the Irish were <laughs> uncomfortable with sending illegal whiskey to the U.S. Yeah. The Scottish were not. Yeah. <laughs> Again. And so Scottish whiskey took over. Laws are funny, man. Just Laws saying. are funny. Just saying. We got Benjamin Ross. Decided to try something a bit unorthodox for me when smoking salmon. I created a brine <gasps> with the Konamara Irish Irish whiskey as the base. Oh, that sounds so good! It turned out to be one of the best things I have ever smoked. Oh. I know several people have wet and dry aged steaks with whiskey soaked rags, but has anyone else done a whiskey fish brine and smoke? Hey guys, if, if you have a, a whiskey cooking recipe, yeah. put it in the comments, Yeah, because I'm going to make all of them. <laughs> That sounds so good to me right now. <laughs> I'm so hungry. <laughs> and bonus points if it involves red vines. <laughs> Here's to fighting, stealing, and drinking. If you fight, may you fight for a friend. If you steal, may you steal a lover's heart. And if you drink, may, may you drink, drink with us. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us in the Whiskey Vault. Don't forget to throw on a like, hit that subscribe button on the bottom right, and drop a question or comment down below.